Um, an effective PR strategy can also help you make the most of communication channels, such as social media and partnerships. There's a lot more you can do there. I don't know why this is not moving forward. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to ask you to do this, Maxine, if that's all right. Because it's not working for me. Um, so the reason PR is important is because it's company awareness. It assists with the sales process. It's not responsible for the sales process because if nothing else is working in terms of your website, if it's not working in cohesion, then it's not gonna not gonna do the sales, but it's gonna get people to your site. It also drives employee engagement and attracts a talent because if your company is seen as a leading company in its field, people are more likely to want to come and work with you. Um, it gives you credibility as well in the way that advertising doesn't because as I say, it's a third party endorsement. It's also cost effective and limitless and limitless and it goes as far as you want it to. So, for example, we worked with an author called Annie Casina, who published a book which was called um, Did You Choose Your Dog More Carefully Than Your Husband? <laughs> so obviously that was quite, quite a good title. Um, but we managed to get her on the front page of the Mail Online. And that was great, you know, because that was worth money she couldn't have paid for. You can't pay for that kind of coverage. But what happened next was like massively was was really quite amazing because we were getting phone calls from Australian television. We got phone calls from from China. It was in the China Daily Post. It was in Indian newspapers. It literally went everywhere because all the other medias were picking up on the story, and 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 just wanted to run up run it. So we had coverage from across the world. And literally, even if she'd had an unlimited advertising budget, it couldn't have got her that. And it was engaging and interesting and funny as well. And that's why people that's why people liked it. So it's so PR, I mean you can spend five hundred pounds on an advertising campaign in the Butchery Press, let's say, but you could spend five hundred pounds on PR and get in the Butchery Press and on get Butch Radio and get on XYZ. So really it goes as far as you want it to. And if you get a good piece of coverage it can end up going other places. Next slide please Maxine. <laughs> So I hate doing this, but I can't uh, work out how to do it myself. So there are three different types of PR. Um, there's owned PR, which is the content that's strategically placed within a news environment. So that could be an advertorial, perhaps. So it looks and feels like a news item or article. And the content appears on websites, mobile sites, blog sites and social media channels. And that can benefit SEO and drive earned media. Owned media is what we specialise in, which is newsworthy content, which is published on core news channels, so newspapers, magazines, broadcast media. And that also includes social sharing, mentions, posts, reposts and reviews. And then there's paid promotion, which is paid advertising, like paid search and display ads, paid influencers, paid content promotions, native advertising and social media ads. So I'm sure everybody's aware of all those different things, but, but earned PR is what we're really talking about here because that's going to be free to you and the most effective way of, of sharing your company's news and opinions. I feel like Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. So, as I said, PR has to be part of a bigger, a bigger thing. It doesn't stand alone. And if you're just doing PR and you're getting one piece in the mail, for example, you know, if it doesn't tie up with everything else and it doesn't tie up with your marketing objectives, there's no point in doing it. So, so you know, the closing the PR loop involves email marketing, social media, public relations, SEO, paid ads, partnerships, and it all has to work towards your marketing objectives. Um, it, it, it's so important because if your key messages aren't right, then you're not going to engage with your audience. Um, and that's, that's really where PR comes in. You have to make sure that's cohesive and working towards your main aims. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Maxine. <laughs> Thank you. So you need to start off by agreeing your key messages. What does your business stand for? Why do your companies buy from you, customers? Um, what do you want your audience to understand about your products and services? Because if you don't know that, you can't communicate that to other people. And, you know, you can actually ask your, your, your audiences why they do buy for you. Find out why did they pick you over your competition? What do they think you stand for? If you have good relationships with your customers, it's really helpful to get that feedback anyway, um, because the reason they buy for you from you is the same reason that other people will buy from you. And those are things that you need to put in all your marketing PR activity and all your PR activity. So that messaging is consistent and they always know who they're dealing with. They know what you stand for. They know whether you're cost effective or whether you're uh, 
highly skilled or whatever the reasons are, you'd hope you're both, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> whatever those reasons are, they need to understand those things. Maxine. So you need to identify your audience and most people know who their audience is, but actually sometimes it's worth narrowing it down because the audience can look massive, but actually if you pull it together, it's, uh, it, it tells you a lot about your business. I mean, a lot of businesses actually don't know who their audience is. We, we met a company once um, and they made HR software. Um, they were a really interesting company and they wanted to be in the, um, the uh, tech press, which was fine, but they wanted to increase their sales. And I said to them, well, that's great, but actually your audience is HR departments. You make HR software. And they said, no, we're a software company. I said, well, you make the software, but actually your audience is the HR departments. And they, they just couldn't see it. Um, and through the H, through the um, software press, through the tech press, they weren't going to reach their target audience. So what they thought they were selling was actually very different from what they were selling. It's a bit like Microsoft. I don't really care how it works. I know it fits, fits my needs. So think about who your audience is. Are they professionals who need your service? Are they HR managers, facilities managers, interior designers? I mean, write down who your customers are, who is most likely to buy from you, even down to male or female or are they parents. Um, where are they based? So I know that we have someone here who runs a shop, I think, in Amersham. So unless you're online, there's very little point promoting your business in the national press. If you are able to service nationally, then national press is great. Um, but think about, you know, who is actually likely to buy for you and where they are. Also, what interests do they have and what type of information will, be that, will they be looking for? Is it advice? Is it product reviews? If you're looking for a beauty product, then somewhere like Style in the Sunday Times is going to be where you're looking. If you're looking for advice and you're looking for business advice, then something like Management Today or HR Magazine could be where you're going. So think about the kind of things that your audience are going to be engaging with. And the next thing is, you know, which media does your audience engage with? How did they find you? And what magazines, what trade magazines do they read? Um, if there's a common thread behind what they're looking at, because, you know, if it's trade media and you're selling HR software, back to that example, then the trade media is going to be things like um, HR magazine or management today and those kind of things. Um, so when you know what you're selling, you're able to identify the kind of magazines that are gonna be of interest. Um, we've got a company at the moment and he's published a book on marketing. Um, now the marketing press aren't interested because that's, they do what he is saying. Uh, what we need to do with him is getting him to the trade press, which is the engineering press, which is his target audience. So going to the marketing press for him is largely irrelevant. It's really the trade press he needs to be in. Um, so think carefully about where your audience will be and what they're reading. Maxine. And evaluate your existing channels. Does your website, social media activity and other marketing activities, does it reflect your brand values properly? Does it reach your target audiences? And does it have an income on the desired outcome? Impact on the desired outcome. Um, we actually have had inquiries from people who have wanted us to do their PR and we've had to say no, because if their website is not reflecting the quality that they want it to, then it's not going to go anywhere. If a journalist goes to your site and it's not up to scratch, it's not gonna work. And all that stuff, again, it comes back to that continuity and that consistency. Um, we were talking to a potential client once and he asked if um, we got paid on sales. So, you know, any coverage we got resulted in sales, we'd get paid that way. And we, we couldn't work with him in the end because actually it's down to his sales team, it's down to his price point, it's down to his website, whether people were gonna buy it. So we could have got him the greatest publicity in the world. But if someone goes to your site and sees that it's not up to scratch or they make contact with your, your team and actually your, uh, your team aren't responding in the right way, all that stuff has an impact. So finding the right channels and evaluating existing channels is really important. And, and look at other channels. What are you not making the most of? Is it social media? Um, is it LinkedIn? Is it Twitter? You know, where are your clients? Again, where are your clients going to be? And think about the channels. Um, even down to things like um, writing blogs for other people in, in associated businesses, uh, which, again, I'll come on to a little bit later. Maxine. So everyone's been asking why Chris Whitty hasn't got a clicker. I feel a bit like that now. Um, so before you start any PR activity, and this is true of all marketing, set clear objectives before embarking on any PR activity. 
what actually are you setting out to achieve? Is it website traffic increase? Is it awareness? Is it sales? I mean, sometimes you know, everybody will say, well, actually, I want to increase, increase sales, but that is not always the case. Some people want to raise their profile and be seen as a thought leader, which is a slightly different thing from setting out to achieve sales. Uh, our marketing guy that we're working with at the moment, he hasn't got anything to sell other than himself. So what he really wants to do is raise awareness within his target audiences, but he's not expecting sales from them. And it's what we do with that coverage that's going to be important. You also need to decide how you measure your activity because you can't put into place an effective strategy unless you measure what's going on. So and then a lot of people do PR and they don't actually keep an eye on their website traffic. So we don't know what's working and what's not unless we tell our clients you need to watch this so we did a project a little while ago and we saw a massive spike in their website visits because we got them in the telegraph so you could quite easily see that was having an impact um, and sometimes you can be in the telegraph it's the wrong story then your clients aren't going to see it and you're not going to see any impact but if it's the right story in the right media you can see how that has an impact on what you do so make sure that you measure your activity make sure there's backlink conclusions where possible uh, and set up website analytics Maxine. So the basics of PR is spread the word and look at your marketing schedule and schedule your PR activity. So things like new product launches, things like events and open days, things like seasonal opportunities. So, for example, so these are some clients we've worked with. So Opera um, is from a company called TVM UK, which is a veterinary pharmaceutical company. So they knew last May that they were launching it. So we put in place a campaign. It's, it's a product which helps keep your pet's eyes clean which my kitten needs actually. Um, I can't stop talking about my kitten, sorry, Natalie. Um, <laughs> but it keeps your pet's eyes clean, basically. Um, so they started Nye Health Awareness Week. So we started planning it in May and they put together a microsite, which was launching in September. So we could start generating publicity in advance about this, um, this eye health campaign. We got vets involved to do radio interviews. Uh, we got it into the veterinary magazines, the veterinary uh, pharmaceutical magazines, but also the veterinary consumer magazines, because that was a really interesting product launch. Um, and they made sales through that and they could see spikes to their website. Um, Buckingham, Buckingham Literary Festival was a project we worked on for three or four years. Um, and they obviously wanted people to attend the festival. So we generated, there was, there was no point advertising nationally and we did get a few pieces nationally, which was great, but their key audience was in Buckinghamshire and the surrounding areas. So we got interviews on BBC Three Counties, um, BBC Radio Oxfordshire, um, and we set up interviews for the authors that were speaking. So there were people like Jacqueline Wilson, um, there were some really high profile speakers um, and we set up interviews for those and that generated publicity to bring people to the festival. And over the years, actually, the more it was known, the more people we had visiting. And Cardinal Clinic, this was something they did to support a local food bank. So this was just something that they wanted to do to promote their CSR activity. Um, so there was no there was no kind of ulterior motive. It was just to sort of show off the food bank, tell people what they were doing and show that they were active in their local community. So there's lots of reasons that you might want to do PR and things that you can pick up on that you can take advantage of. But if you are looking at product launches, look, look at your marketing schedule. So if you're launching, I know somebody here who I won't name, um, but we need to have a chat because, you know, you want to discuss the new product launch that you're doing. Um, so you need to look at how that fits in with the rest of your marketing schedule and plan it in advance. So our veterinary client actually has given us a whole list that, and their whole list of the year's activities. So we know that in May, we need to do this to set up what's going to be going on in September. So that marketing schedule is vital. Maxine, <laughs> I'm getting used to this now. I'm going to start getting power crazy. So the creative ideas should attract interest from the audience to engage with your target audience. So think big, brainstorm ideas. If budget was unlimited, what would you do? Because actually, if you think if budget was unlimited, you can scale it back to work out what you could do more cost effectively. Um, think creatively, what would make people get involved? Develop a smart multi-channel campaign. How can you take advantage of everything you're doing across all channels? Look at what your competition is doing as well. Um, people sort of see their competition in, in the press and they kind of think, well, why are they there? But actually look at what they're doing, look at where they're being seen, track them because you can copy them, <laughs> you know, and you need to get there before they do. Um, and work out your tactics. How will you contact the press? And we'll come on to that a bit later. I just want to talk you through about a couple of things that we've got here that we've worked on. So one of them was um, a proposed campaign um, which was put on hold because of coronavirus, but it was a proposed campaign for a local um, 
and they're called children's farm, basically. Um, and we were thinking about what to do for Halloween. So we came up with this idea because obviously the, the children's farm is all about small bunny rabbits and guinea pigs and farm animals. So it's all very sweet. So for Halloween, we thought we could put on a special event where we would have scary animals. So you could have a snake or you could have um, tarantulas and things like that. And that could have been a really good way to attract interest from people just to raise their profile. And, you know, you could have had witches there carrying their snakes and the children would have interacted with these animals they wouldn't meet on a day to day basis. And that would have been a really good opportunity to, to, to spin the story a little bit. I hate that word spin, but to, to turn the story around. So it's not just about doing the same old, same old. They were actually doing something completely new and interesting. Um, the other thing that I did in the past, I used to work for a mental health charity called SANE. Um, and we, I happened to see in the paper, this was a few years ago, that A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe was coming out. Um, and as we were a mental health charity, and people weren't really talking about mental health in the same way they do now. But I thought maybe what we could do was team up with the distributor in the UK and maybe do something. So I set up a meeting with the distribution company and they agreed to work with us to hold two pre-screenings. So before the film was released in, released in the cinemas, they agreed to hold two screenings with us in Soho. So we invited our supporters to come along to say thank you for their support. And we had a little sort of champagne thing and then everyone went and watched the film. But the second one was aimed at the press. And the press came down to watch the film in advance because it was quite a special thing to do. And bearing in mind, this didn't cost us anything. This was just picking up on an, an opportunity. So we got the journalists down and they wrote stories. And the, the interesting thing about it actually was one of the journalists couldn't make it and she worked for The Sun, which was a really important target for us because they had a really bad reputation for doing mental health stories. Um, so I really wanted to get her there, but that wasn't going to happen. So I ended up talking to the distribution company and they agreed to let her have a DVD to watch it in the comfort of her own home for an evening and then pick up the DVD the next day so it couldn't be shared. And on the back of that, we got two pages in the sun. And again, this, this didn't cost anything. This was completely free. It took that phone call to the distribution company that made all this happen. So it didn't cost the charity anything except for a few bottles of champagne. So those kind of creative ideas and partnerships work really well. Um, and TVM, I've already sort of mentioned their um, their uh, Okra Animal Eye Health Week, which was really good. And they got the vets involved as well. So actually talking to the vets who use the product and getting them on the radio meant that they're more loyal to the company now because we've been promoting them too. So, you know, there, there's no need for massive budgets. Think about if your budget was unlimited, but then scale it back and find out ways that you could do it yourself for less money. There are going to be partners out there that you can team up with. Actually, on the subject, I remember when I started the company, um, I there was a local um, uh, sort of property um, office letting company, um, and we decided to get a whole bunch of experts in and have like a day, an open day, where people could come in and talk to the experts around the table. So it was a chance to show off their office space. It was a chance for us to do our little PR thing and for other businesses, other marketing businesses to be there and accountants. And we got a lot of press coverage for that just because about that sort of partnership. And I just rang them and said, would you be willing to work with us on this? And they said, yes. And so often just making those phone calls can be a great way of, of generating those partnerships in the same way that you do with networking, but just think of it slightly differently. Maxine. So the other thing that's really important is thought leadership. Um, and that positions you and your company as credible, knowledgeable and trustworthy. And you can do that through commissioned articles and contributions, news hijacking and personal profiling. So, for example, Martin Reed, um, he's now left, but he was CEO of Thomas International, uh, which has psychometric assessments. And we did a lot of PR for them um, for about two, three years. Uh, and we had columns for him in different publications, lots of HR publications, talking about the importance of psychometrics, talking about how it worked, um, talking about even staff management. So actually, we went off the subject of psychometrics and made them a thought leader in the HR field. Um, and we had regular columns and it, it didn't look it wasn't paid for. Um, but it was a column that was 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 interesting to the audience. It was engaging. It was something you could sort of really delve into. And we've done the same with people like Alex Pratt, who runs Serious Readers. He published a book and we did a lot of thought leadership with him, um, talking about business issues, doing business in the age of austerity. Um, and we have regular columns in, in business newspapers and uh, sorry, business supplements and in magazines. Uh, Jane Piper is an organizational psychologist who wrote a book about um, time management. So we had her in a lot of the business press talking about how you can manage your time better. And that was good because it worked for big organizations and small organizations and individuals as well who wanted advice on how to how to keep home and work separate. 
and Stephen and Mara Klemek are clients of ours. They run Heart Styles, uh, which is a personal development company. Um, and they've been on the radio doing a lot of talking about personal development, talking about New Year's resolutions um, in terms of your personal development. Um, and all those things, you know, but what, what tends to happen is you've got a good idea for a topic and you go to one of the target media that you've identified and you've got a unique take on it. You can go to them and say, look, I am interested in this subject. I could contribute an article on X, Y, and Z. They'll come back to you and say, well, yes, no. And you can tailor then your approach to show that you're able to think outside the box a little bit and that you're able to contribute an article. And a lot of our clients get commissioned uh, for a thousand words or 2000 words, or that's a bit scary actually, but 500 word articles on, on different topics. So we've just had um, a thousand word article um, commissioned from our marketing client. Um, to talk about marketing in the aerospace industry. Um, that's how it works. Um, and it sounds really daunting, but actually it's not. If you've got your key messages, if you've got your opinions in place, those if, if you're in that field and you want to be seen as a thought leader, that's a good way to go about it. Maxine. So case studies are also really important. Case studies, if you are a charity or an organization where you can use case studies, I think we've got a business coach here as well. Case studies can bring your work to life and demonstrate the real impact of what your company does. It's particularly good with charities actually. So for our mental health charity, case studies were vital to get on the radio and get on the news. So this particular thing uh, was um, for a client who was, which was a psych psychiatric clinic. And this um, woman uh, was, admitted as a patient and she talked into the independent about how depression left her incapacitated um and it was about her it was about her story but our client got a mention showing that my doorbell is ringing <laughs> i don't know what to do now do i go and get the door do you mind if i go and get the door <laughs> bear with me Slight interval, everybody. <laughs> Take this opportunity to uh, grab a drink quickly. Just also a reminder, we do have the chat room open. So if you do have any questions throughout, please do uh, bring something up in there that we can either address at the end of uh, Kerry's webinar, um, or if it's quite relevant at that time, I can uh, interrupt and, and put that forward then. Um, but we will be having Q and A's at the end. joys of working from home. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's something my boyfriend ordered as well. So it's something giant and um, I've got no idea what it is. Right, so the case study. So this was in the independent and it got a client mentioned. Uh, they talked a little bit about what they did to help her, about the reason that depression affected her in this way. And it was a really interesting piece that engaged with the audience. So if you've got, I'm out of breath now, throwing up the stairs. If you've got a database of people uh, who have worked with you and might be willing to be case studies, find out their details, get their story, get images, look at the right kind of media to pitch them to based on age, gender, location. So for example, if you've got someone in their 50s, they're not going to be seen in Glamour magazine. Um, they're more likely to be featured in something like Good Housekeeping. So think about you know, where they're going to fit best and check whether they're happy to be identified. So we've got a dental client at the moment and we need the case studies to go into um, to the sun. Um, and some of them don't wanna have their names mentioned, which means we're not gonna be able to use them. Um, but if you've got the case studies, and also, I mean, usually everybody gathers, um, not case studies necessarily, but testimonials for their website. So it's really, it's about the testimonials, but just developing a bit more into their case studies. And even if, if you've got a blog, you could use a case study in, that's, that's something that's really valuable. I'm going to try and get my breath back while Maxine there. Uh, and I've also lost my kitten, so I'm really hoping he hasn't run out of the, uh, the house. Honestly, working from home. So, how to contact the media. So, you need to do intensive research into your target media and build a media list detailing names, emails and phone numbers of publications. Most magazines and newspapers carry journalist contact details and you can do the research into TV and radio program contacts. I mean, even if you just go on LinkedIn, if you if you go through, so like I said, I've got men's health here. If I just go to the contact page or the editorial page, I can find out who's responsible for fitness or, or well-being or style or whatever. And I can just Google them and generally you'll get their email up. 
Um, and even if it's a TV programme, you know, um, if it's BBC, what it tends to be is first name dot second name at bbc.co.uk. So if I know somebody that I want to contact at the BBC, that's how it, how it will work. Um, social media research as well. Don't forget to use Twitter uh, to look for journalists. And a good tip, actually, is there is a hashtag called journo requests. So if you use hashtag journal requests, you will see what journalists are requesting from people. So that's never a bad idea to keep an eye on that. And you can start, you can start from that, working out who writes about what. So uh, a good place to start is press release, which I'll come on to in a bit. Um, but you need to pitch in the body of an email with a short covering note. Um, and after you sent the press release or pitch, I recommend getting on the phone. Now there's a big debate going on right now um, with um, PRs, because some people are saying, no, I never follow up. I don't like doing it. Some journalists are saying, never follow up. We hate it. But actually, I think it's worthwhile. Um, we've had conversations with journalists which have turned something that maybe they weren't interested in initially into something else. They've made sure that it's, um, it, it, you're having that conversation. They say, well, we're interested in this, but not necessarily that. And then we say, well, actually, how about from this angle then? Or how about with a case study? How about, so those conversations can be really useful. I mean, we've been doing something with the Buckley Press and we've stalked them and stalked them and stalked them uh, by email um, and, and by phone. But the only way they're going to engage with us is because we're, we're actually stalking them. I know it sounds awful, but sometimes it works. We actually had a story in the Daily Telegraph. It was a page in the Glossy magazine, which is called Stella. And um, it took us 21 emails to get that story. <laughs> and because they get so many emails, so many emails, you just need to be persistent. And I say stalking. I mean, it's not stalking. We don't want to be a pain. But she literally hadn't seen our email because she gets thousands of emails every day. So it's just about being persistent. Obviously, something like that is going to be harder to get into than it is to something like the Buxbury Press or it is to management today. But... That the, the message is still the same. Just just keep persevering um, and track your progress. So every journalist we speak to, we've got all our databases. Every journalist we speak to, we make notes of the conversations to refer back to, um, so we know who's talking, which which of what, which of us is talking to which journalist, what we've done, whether we've sent an email, whether we've had a discussion about um, their kids or about you know which pitch we put forward, what they were interested in, whether they wanted a case study. So when we go back to them in a few weeks' time. We can pick up where we left off and we know what's going on. Vaccine, please can I have the next slide. I'm really proud of now, my kitten's gone missing. I can't see him. He hasn't run out the front door. Um, right, so press releases, they are a good way to get to the press, and people will often ask for a press release depending on what the story is. So it's basically used for news. So if you've got a new product, if you've got an event or an open day, anniversaries are good. So if you're celebrating your 10th anniversary as a company, um, being shortlisted for or winning awards, and I would highly recommend looking into any awards system, um, schemes that are going on. The BBF awards are close to this year, but keep an eye on local awards because they're well worth entering. Um, new staff appointments, depending on how big your company is, if you've taken on a new member of staff, that's usually quite interesting. Um, company announcements, if you're doing partnerships with other companies or results of fundraising events. So the kind of things we've used um, uh, press releases for recently we're doing some work with bbf on the low carbon workspaces um so that required a press release um, we're doing something about um the, the business awards actually we did a pr for that so that required a press release um and new products that we're working with so like i say they're not appropriate for everything but for news they are worthwhile doing and it's got the inverted, py inverted pyramid so it's the most newsworthy information so who what where why when and how then the important details, which might be a quote from you talking about why you're doing what it is you're doing um, and other general background information. And if you've got images, use images. Um, journalists and newspapers really like pictures. Um, it obviously gives them something to illustrate the story. Um, and it's, it's a nice way to show who you are as well. Um, and I think... Uh, I think... Um, the other general information is editor's notes um, and background information that you can uh, put in. So, you know, your email address, your, your phone number, how they can contact you. Um, that has to be important because contact details, people forget to put their contact details in. So if journalists do want further information, they don't know how to contact you. And that's um, important. 
Maxine, would you mind if I take two seconds just to go and see if I can find the kitten to check he hasn't run out the front door because he's only a week old? I'm we, sorry, everybody. We don't want you stressing. <laughs> I am stressing a little bit because he's normally running around. I'm very sorry, everybody. This is the peril of working from home. He's only little. He really is little. He is. <laughs> I'm myself as well, so I can't. Uh, you don't need to necessarily hear me. <laughs> Screaming in the background. Apologies, everyone. Um, I'm hoping Kerry will find. Ziggy, the kitten. Um, this is okay. This is really useful, actually. I um, didn't know what to expect coming along this morning. And I think it's, uh, in my mind, and there's something I'll ask Kerry at the end, it's always something that you think is sort of for bigger businesses. And so it's quite interesting to hear how even little little bits of, of um, activity would help. So I know mm. I'm finding this really interesting. That's great, Natalie. That's great. Yeah, Kerry's, um, she's, she's, got yeah she's uh she's always quite sort of um what's the word I'm looking for she yeah she really goes into great detail um mm. and you know she's obviously always happy to take anything offline if you wanted some more information after this morning's session um obviously we you know we try and cram everything in especially a virtual session you know within a, an hour but obviously please when we get back to uh, doing everything face to face and, and able to get together you know that's when we're able to do it for a little bit longer and we can have that networking the joys of networking yeah definitely she's back Hi, everybody. i'm so sorry perils of working from home and having a kitten i thought you'd be on the on me at some point so um so those are press releases is that i hope that makes sense to everybody um I'm happy to send an example to people if they want to see the kind of things that I mean. <laughs> Maxine, <laughs> do you know also the doorbell hasn't rung at all in the last week. The kitten hasn't run away, so it would happen now. So it's I've got a dog mounting my leg as we speak, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <that>. Thanks, Nat. <laughs> and my daughter's listening as well, so honestly, don't worry about it. <laughs> It's good I haven't sworn as well then. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. <Yeah. laughs> um, so a lot of people tend to get press coverage and they put it in a drawer and they forget about it. And actually what you really need to do is maximise it because it'll only go so far by itself. So post links to press coverage on business social media platforms. So um, I was in The Guardian last week talking about um, working from home um, and how we're working longer hours working from home. So because of that, I put that on um, on my Twitter, I put it on my Facebook, and I put it on um, LinkedIn as well. So the more people that see it, the better, and it shows that you're present, it shows that you're being seen in the press. And if it's a commissioned article uh, where you've got 500 or 1,000 words, it's actually really engaging. Um, we had a client in Raconteur, which is um, a supplement that comes out with Sunday Times every now and again, and they had a big piece on um, businesses with purpose. So they put that on LinkedIn and because it was in a prestigious newspaper, you know, people read it. It was engaging. It was interesting. Um, and that did a lot for their profile. Um, if you have a sales team, um, tell them to tell your clients about the coverage that's been achieved. Not in a kind of, oh, guess what? We were in the Telegraph the other day. But, you know, it's it, it, if you can bring it up with clients and potential clients and put it on your website if possible, although you've got to be careful with copyright rules. But if you can um, tell your sales team about it, then they will be able to spread the word more. Um, also create a press page on your website if possible and use the mastheads of the publications that you're featured in. So you can see here, this is Annie Casina, our client who ended up in sort of international media. And she... Um, she uh, set up a press page to show where she'd been featured. And you can see there that she was on BBC and Cosmopolitan, the Mail and Glamour, um, China, <laughs> China Today, for example. So, that, so people going on her site to maybe use her as a relationship coach, another kid won't leave me alone, um, to use her as a relationship coach could see that she was somebody who was serious and credible because she'd been featured in those magazines. Um, and also, you know, if you're doing newsletters, include links to the coverage and as featured in, in other marketing collateral, so newsletters in blogs, things like that. Um, just make it go as far as possible because putting it in a drawer means a lot of people aren't going to see it. 
and if it's that credibility that you're after and if it's that um if you people want your audience on linkedin to see it use it and it's i know it's going to be really embarrassing as well people don't like to show off the coverage they they've had and we don't like it either and we work in pr so we have to make our clients do it even if we don't make ourselves do it um maxine <laughs> Um, so social media, um, if you're not on social media, then I would highly recommend being on social media. Um, everybody knows these channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, they're not all going to be relevant to you. Um, I don't really do much for the company on Facebook. We've got a page, but I don't really use it. Uh, we use Twitter a lot and LinkedIn a lot. Um, something new that's worth investigating is a new social media platform called Clubhouse. And I don't know if anyone's heard of it, uh, but Clubhouse is like an audio uh sort of platform where you can find different rooms um so i logged into one the other day you just you have to have an iphone because it's still in sort of um testing mode but you can find a room that's interesting to you so i found one about marketing and you can listen as part of the audience or you can speak if you're invited to um you need to kind of check it to see how it works but it's, it is interesting and i think that for a lot of you actually hosting rooms would be quite good because you can host your own rooms, which is a bit like hosting a webinar. Um, it's just that people can tune in and out as they choose and ask questions in real time. It's quite, it, it, to begin with, it was a bit of a time waster for me actually. So I need to pick my rooms very carefully, but it's worth looking at. Um, when you're doing social media, work out your hashtags. So what you do, so we always use PR, marketing, et cetera, uh, who your potential clients are, areas you operate in, um, and creative or popular hashtags, so PR advice, so about Thursday, whatever it might be. And again, check what your competition is doing, because if they're doing something and it's working well, then you can follow that as well. And engage with them as well. There's no harm in engaging with the competition, um, because you never know, you might be able to work together somehow. And make sure you engage with the audience. So like things, retweet and respond, talk to people. Um, liking is fine, you know, just, just do that. But if you can create a conversation with somebody, then, then you're going to get further ahead and generate your own content. I'm sure you all know this anyway, but it's worth reiterating that blogs, press coverage, photos from events, press releases, videos, anything like that is worth putting up um, and it will ensure that you're seen and more engaged with Maxine. And think beyond media relations. Um, so what other channels and activities can benefit your profile and raise awareness among your audiences? So these are some examples that we've been involved with. So James Rosa Associates, we've written a blog for their website, which he sends out on social media every now and again. Uh, the Cat's Pajamas uh, is a group that I'm involved with, um, and they interviewed all their members and they've put that out online. Um, Medium was another organisation that asked us for a blog that we contributed, Spotlight Magazine again. Um, my David Matter consultancy um, did a piece of sort of profiling me and the company. Um, and if you know people who are doing those sorts of things, I mean, quite often people get stuck for blog ideas. So if there's a way that you can write a blog that complements them, or if you've got a partner that you work with and you can say, look, would you be interested in writing a blog for me? Quite often they'll return the favour. Um, and again, it helps with SEO. It helps spread the word wider. Um, so it's just about maximising the channels you already have. We have a lot of contacts with marketing agencies because we are not a marketing agency. So the work we do can complement what they do. So writing blogs for them is really beneficial. And of course, they promote it then through their channels. Thanks. <laughs> I'm beginning to wish we hadn't recorded this now, actually, because we can't reuse it because I've had to run away and find my kitten. <laughs> So the post-campaign evaluation areas uh, is the results versus objectives. You need to make sure you're actually achieving your objectives. Hard evidence, so quantitative research, website and social media analytics, because if you don't know, if you don't know what's driving people to your site, you won't know how to continue. Um, if you're doing something that works, then keep doing it. Um, but you've got to make sure you actually track this, because being in one of the magazines that you think is going to be of interest and drive people to your site might not actually be the case at all. Um, the soft evidence is obviously qualitative research, observation, anecdotal. We get that quite a lot, actually, from our veterinary client because they have a sales team that go into their vets. Um, and the vets often say to them, oh, I saw you in this magazine the other day, or I was really interested in this article you wrote. So we get quite a lot of anecdotal research, uh, anecdotal information from them. 
Um, in the same way, actually, recently a guy I've been talking to on LinkedIn um, said to me that my name or company name had come up in conversation a few times recently. Um, and that's just through the work we do th through networking and things. So it's interesting to keep an eye on that and see what's working and who's talking about you and why, hopefully for good reasons. Um, and also set up evaluation methods for moving forward. I think of new ways that you can evaluate things and keep track of it as well. So don't just, it's, it's really easy to say, I know, because everyone's very, very busy. The more you can kind of uh, do this on a regular basis, the better it will be. A lovely assistant. So finally, uh, make PR part of your marketing strategy. Um, it's really essential and you probably do have a marketing strategy somewhere, but if you can get it on paper and make PR part of it, then it will complement what you're doing. Um, do your research into the right media for you, even if it means buying all the papers or getting subscriptions or whatever. Like I say, I'm at my kitchen table right now and I have got a stack of magazines that I need to go through because they're good opportunities for our clients. And there's no point, you know, journalists get crazy if you pitch a housing story and they work in tech, which happens quite a lot because people don't research the media and that's, that's not gonna make you popular. Set aside the time to do it. So even if it's just an hour a week, just set aside the time to think about the opportunities and think about how you can do it and, and monitor what your competition are doing, because if they're doing it, maybe, and it's working, maybe it's worth replicating what they're doing. Keep your eyes open for opportunities. So even in this room, you know, there might be partnerships that you can develop with one another. There might be blogs that you can do for one another. There's, there's bound to be a way that you can work together. And be persistent. As I said, I, I mean, I said stalking earlier, I was kind of exaggerating a little bit, but you know, if you send a press release out once, it's probably not gonna get picked up the first time. So if it's worth following it up or it's worth trying it again, and even just saying, you know, sorry to bother you again, I just wondered if you'd seen this, is it of interest? Um, and find out, so find out what the journalists are writing about to make sure it is the kind of thing that they cover. And, and be patient, you know, PR is not a magic bullet, the lead times for magazines. So if we're talking about, um, I'm looking at men's health just because it's at the top of my pile. But if you're talking about men's health, their lead time is five to six months. So if you want to be in a consumer magazine like that, that's obviously a very long planning time. Um, if it's business magazines, they tend to be shorter. If it's regional magazine, regional newspapers, they tend to be about a week um, because they're more news focused. Um, so the lead times of different magazines are are different. Um, obviously, online goes up pretty much straight away, um, but it's it's not magic. And one piece of coverage is not going to revolutionise your business. But if you do it consistently and you set aside that time, it's going to have a good impact on your business, and use it properly as well. Maxine. Uh, and questions. And I also want to say, if we don't have time to go through anyone's questions here, um, then we are offering a 30 minute brainstorm. So happy to organise that if you want to drop me a line or give me a call on those details. And I'm sure that will be circulated by Maxine later anyway. And connect with me on LinkedIn as well, because uh, if you want to have a chat with me that way, then I'm happy to discuss. But if we can open up to questions, um, I'm happy to discuss kittens, deliveries and PR related things. Thank you. Go for it, is that Duncan? Yeah, hi, yes. Um, I guess just so I'm clear in my mind, in terms of the services that you provide then, as I understand it, it would be evaluating different, let's say, channels or media outlets, but also advising on content as well, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, well, we, we, we will work with clients to, to work out where they need to be. Uh, work out what those magazines are going to be interested in and work with you to develop pitches and strategies to get into those magazines. So it involves coming up with sort of five or six key messages that we would take forward to the press. So we're working with a management consultancy right now and everybody in this group has got different areas of expertise. We've got a retail expert. Um, so we have come up with a list of maybe five topics that he wants to comment on. And we're taking this forward to the press. And we write the content as well, because often it makes more sense for us to interview the client to get the information and then develop the content for them. Does that answer that? That does, because actually my second question was going to be uh, any examples of you know good or, or poor quality ways to do content, but actually you're helping people write it. Yes. Yeah, so I'm... I'm not yet, I don't think at the stage where I'd be doing PR, but I could see it six, 12 months time. And that is one of the things I think, oh, writing like 500 words <laughs> or 2000. Uh... Yes, no, it's, um, yeah, it, it can be a bit daunting. And actually it's quite daunting when we have to do it for ourselves. It's much easier to do it for clients. Yeah. 
Same with the ward entries, actually. It was quite difficult. We always encourage people to do award entries and they hate doing it because they think it involves showing off. But actually, if you don't do it, no one else is going to do it. <laughs> so well, we'll do it for you. But uh, it's, um, it's difficult to blow your own trumpet sometimes, but it's, it's hard to get your thoughts out. I always think it's like that Harry Potter thing, you know, when they've got the wand and they bring out the thoughts and they put them in that font thing. I always think that's kind of our job with clients is to bring out the thoughts that are in their brain and put them into some kind of order. Good, thank you. That's Teresa there. I can't see Teresa. Um, it's writing a pitch, make it short, make it snappy, find a good headline. Um, the shorter the better really people don't want to be reading tons and tons of stuff um, I would always put a press release if, if it's a relevant story put a press release underneath the main pitch but make the pitch short snappy dear so and so contacting you regarding this uh, put, I can comment on this this and this this if you'd be interested in speaking to me please get in touch um, and come up with something it's difficult to give you a snappy headline without knowing what the project is but uh, if you can come up with a short and snappy headline to get their attention that would be helpful. Kerry, um, Kate Hughes uh, said that she'd love to see an example. Kate, I can't remember at what point that was. I, I think it was press release. Was it press release? I think so. Kate, was that right? Kate's disappeared. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I that? Sorry, yes. I was just unmuting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> no problem I'll, I'll find something um i'll find something that will work for you through what you do on linkedin so you can see how it how it works that'd be great thank you very much you're welcome anybody else kerry can i just say so, so my name is carl moore and i'm the founder of a mentoring service for young people we support young yeah. people around their mental health um, lifestyle and well-being and I just wanted to say I really appreciate this session because it's given me some new ideas from the PR perspective, because at the moment, if I'm honest, over the last six months, I've kind of just been relying on word of mouth. I've been working with young people for around the last 12 years. So that has carried me through to a degree. But I think when it kind of comes to growing the service to um, a wider audience, that's kind of where I'm at right now. So I actually just wanted to say I really appreciate um, some of the content you've delivered today. And I really do want to book in that complimentary 30 minute brainstorm, if that's all right, just to kind of see um, what areas I should be kind of targeting, because I do write blogs, I do write articles. And I guess knowing where to put those articles and blogs would probably be <laughs> really beneficial for me. Yeah. And also, um, if you're doing mentoring stuff as well, if you're doing mentoring stuff, if that's your business, then there's quite a lot of opportunities on um, broadcast media as well right now. So, okay. you know, talking about the issues that are affecting young people, those are good mm -hmm. places to be seen and talk about. And because 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 one of the things with PR as well, you're actually offering advice to people. You're not just um, sending stuff out. The idea is to share your knowledge and share the information and give people advice. So with what you're doing, I think there are lots of opportunities for you to, to spread the word. 100%. I really appreciate that. I, I did recently do an article around what I'm seeing is affecting young people the most with lockdown and my top yeah. tips on how parents can support their young people during lockdown um so yeah I feel like we're kind of on the same uh, wavelength with that so I'd really appreciate kind of touching base and kind of going forward perfect well drop me an email and uh, we can set up a time I will do thank Thanks, you <laughs> Kerry um Emily uh, has posted something in the chat room I don't know if you want me to read it out if you're starting marketing your business with a professional, how far in advance should you consider PR? <laughs> it, um, they, well, PR is a good thing to bring in early, actually. Um, we have conversations with people who are just starting um, and they maybe start, start a website, but actually it's not doing it's not working in their key messages so it's a good time to work with the PR agency really early on um, because we can help with that those brand messages we're not a branding company so the branding is slightly different but we can help with those key messages and work out how to take them forward with you so um, so it's, it's good to get that kind of thing sorted early on just so you can get things set up um, even even if it's just a chat so you can have that in your in your mind as you take things forward which is why this 30 minute brainstorm is not necessarily a bad idea to do because it gives you that sort of thought process to go through um, we do actually offer strategy days 
um, where we spend half a day with um, somebody going through their business in detail. And then we go away and write a PR strategy for them that they can go away and implement themselves because that helps them get the key, the key messages sorted out. It helps them know who they're targeting, how to target them, and then they can go away and begin their work doing it themselves. The, the trick is with that, that we're spending the time doing it. But I hope that helps anyway. <laughs>